Uh, to start things off tonight, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge country. Uh, and we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community and pay respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to any indigenous uh, peoples here today. Uh, and we acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, for me personally, as we meet virtually, obviously people are on uh, different lands. Uh, for me personally, where I am uh, in Roseville, it's the Camaragal people of the Dug Nation that are the traditional uh, custodians. So obviously there'll be different, uh, different traditional owners in different places. So we've got a very interesting evening for you this evening uh, with a couple of expert uh, panellists joining uh, Nick and the team today. Um, and, and the focus of the session obviously is integrity in politics. And really where we want to start is, is probably the, the, the most common topic to speak about there, which is around um, federal ICAC and, and why does Australia even uh, need that? But then beyond ICAC, um, what else is required to actually restore uh, integrity to politics? Um, and we also obviously want to provide everyone with the opportunity to ask uh, Nicolette questions about her uh, position in these uh, important areas. Um, so to start with, there'll be or roughly 30 minutes uh, of uh, conversation, uh, starting with uh, uh, Anthony Wheely, the Honourable Anthony Wheely QC, um, who'll talk through the different uh, ICAC models. Um, Hello. <laughs> and then uh, Saffron Zoma will um, lead us through some other uh, items required to restore integrity um, to politics, uh, and then we'll we'll jump to Nicolette and, and her positions before the before the Q and A. And so, uh, speaking of the panel, uh, so as you mentioned, uh, Nicolette Buller, who should be familiar to all of you uh, by now. Now, prior to becoming uh, our community independent, Nicolette uh, was an executive at the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia and helped establish the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. She also worked with her brother, Richard, at Benara, uh, which is a consulting company, and was a, she was a certified uh, accountability practitioner there, uh, providing uh, non-financial audit and accountability solutions, uh, looking at uh, leadership, culture, and systems. So integrity is near and dear to her heart. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, the Honourable Anthony Wheely QC joining us, a uh, former judge of the New South Wales Court of Appeal and currently the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity, uh, and Saffron Zoma, was a lawyer, campaigner, and political strategist with more than a decade of experience leading law reform campaigns. Uh, Saffron is the founder and executive director of the Australian Democracy Network, bringing people and organisations together to campaign for the changes that make our democracy more open, fair, transparent, and participatory. Uh, I'd also like to note that I'd like to make it clear that Saffron and Anthony are both here in a non-partisan capacity um, to explain and endorse better policies and integri integrity in public life. They're not supporting individual uh, candidates or parties. Uh, so without further ado, I might relinquish the sharing of the screen and hand over to the Honourable Anthony Wheely QC. Thanks, Ed. Um, well, very broadly, the first question is, uh, why do we need a, a Federal Integrity Commission? And uh, the answer to that is uh, pretty obvious. First of all, every state and territory has one. Uh, and it's only the it's only in the federal sphere that such a body is lacking. And if we look around the states and territories, despite the attack from time that's made on these bodies, I, I believe that they actually do a very good job, and uh, and and a very important job. Um, I mean, Dominic Perrottet, at the height of Scott Morrison's attack on the New South Wales ICAC calling it a kangaroo court in relation to the investigation into Gladys Berejiklian. And Dominic Perrottet uh, disagreed vehemently and said that in his opinion, ICAC does a very important job. <laughs> it had done incredibly important work over the years. Can we finish the last one, didn't So that's, I think, uh, it uh, brings me back to the fact that we don't have such a body in the federal sphere. Yeah. Um, now, it wouldn't matter so much if everything was plain sailing and integrity was assured at federal level, but we know that all is not well there, and we know that because of a series of audit office reports that have uncovered and reported very unfavourably on the current government's uh, misuse of uh, public monies. So this isn't just something that comes out of the blue. Uh, we've, ref we've been referred to, for example, the sports rort scandal and the car park 
uh, funding scheme, both of which were very heavily criticised by the audit office. And it's because of those uh, instances of worrying behaviour that more than ever we need a federal ICAC. And I want to say just by way of introduction that a federal anti-corruption body, of course, is not the solution to everything that's wrong in public administration at the present time. Um, I mean, we need to have better standards of integrity in public life. And, and we look to uh, both major parties uh, to improve this situation from the present state of um, rather unattractive uh, lack of integrity that's really apparent um, in, many, in many avenues of investigation. Um, and if we're going to talk about integrity, we're really talking about the qualities of honesty, uh, of uh, transparency and accountability. They are the three pillars on which integrity is built. And when we look at public life at the moment, each of those areas can be very much improved. And so the standards have to lift up and ICAC, a federal ICAC, will help to do that, but it won't do it on its own. But at least it will do two things, and that is to uncover corruption where it exists. And secondly, uh, to provide really good education and guidance to those involved in public administration, which will in due course improve standards. So when we look at the various models around the country, uh, the Centre for Public Integrity has done a fair bit of research on this. You can find the papers on our website. Um, and the net result of it all is that of all the models, the state and territory models, um, Helen Haynes's bill, which she's so far unsuccessfully tried to have debated in parliament, uh, and even the Labor Party's statement of principles for a federal integrity commission they would introduce, all are stronger than the federal government's model. And that's very concerning, I think. So why is that so? Well, if we turn to Helen Haynes's bill, because it's the most recent example, I think, of a very carefully worked out uh, draft piece of legislation it's been prepared by some of the, the best uh, legal and minds, academic minds and integrity bodies around the country. They've all had tremendous amount of input and it's about, you know, it's about 300 pages long. It's not something you want to read overnight um, unless you are an insomniac. But I can tell you for that those of us who have studied it are very impressed by it because it has a wide definition of what is corrupt conduct it has a wide range of powers equal to a royal commission that can be used by the body to uncover corruption. It has protections for people whose reputations might be unfairly damaged. And it has um, the ability to hold public hearings and issue public reports, just as a royal commission does. So um, it's, it's a powerful document. When we turn to the government's model, uh, and I've described it as the weakest model in Australia. That's our, what our research has shown. Uh, it has a very narrow definition of corruption. It, it confines itself to a list of criminal offences and a list of specific criminal offences. And for reasons I'll deal with in a moment, that really isn't good enough. Uh, secondly, uh, it has a threshold. And that means that you can't even initiate an investigation um, unless you're reasonably satisfied that a criminal offence has occurred. Well, you can see the problem there immediately. If a government agency refers a matter to the government under its model in relation to politicians, uh, parliamentarians or their staff or about three quarters of the public service, nothing can be done. It can't go any further unless the commission is satisfied of that threshold. But how can you be satisfied reasonably that a criminal offence has occurred when you haven't even begun to investigate? And the answer to that is you really can't in 99 out of 100 cases. The other problems can be very briefly stated. 
Uh, first of all, you'll be amazed to know that there is no capacity for whistleblower complaints so that nobody in the public service who sees corruption occurring around them can lodge what's called a whistleblower complaint. They can't do it. It's not permitted. And that's the only uh, body around Australia that has that limitation on it. Secondly, the uh, Commission itself can't act on its own initiative, broadly speaking. So that means that if I were the Commissioner of a federal, of the government's federal model, uh, and I became aware that there was a very troubling event, uh, I, we, I couldn't investigate it. I cannot act on my own initiative. And indeed, no member of the public can lodge a complaint uh, under the government's uh, model. And that, again, is uh, st rather striking, isn't it? Um, and finally, we can say that there are no public hearings allowed in the case of politicians, parliamentarians, their staff, and uh, three quarters of the public service. No public hearings at all. No discretion to have a public hearing. And no public reports in relation to the matter may be published. So, I mean, it really is uh, very clear, I think, that the government's model is based upon the premise that they do not wish this body, if it were established, to be effective. And, and that is very worrying from a point of view of public policy. Uh, the Labor Party um, have not produced draft legislation, so it's hard to compare it precisely uh, to Helen Haynes's bill, but at least they have put out a set of principles that they say they would embody in a bill presented to Parliament and those principles broadly align with the important matters that I've mentioned. That is a broad definition of corruption, wide powers equal to those of a Royal Commission, uh, whistleblower complaints are permitted and um, public hearings and public reports um, are allowed. So I don't think we can be critical of the Labor Party's model. It, we just haven't seen the detail yet. Um, now, I think I've just got time, I think, to um, deal with, as it were, uh, two points. Uh, and, and the first is, um, come, let me come back to the definition of corrupt conduct. Why is it not uh, sufficient to just have a list of criminal offences? And the answer to that, of course, is to really understand what corruption is, what corrupt conduct is and what a lack of integrity in government decision-making is. When a minister makes a decision, we do have a statement of ministerial standards. And what is at the heart of that statement of ministerial standards is that decisions must be made in the public interest. They can't be made for personal, political or partisan gain. So that's a breach of the ministerial standards if they are. But our, our ministerial standards are neglected they're not supervised by an independent body. Um, any decision as to whether a ministerial standard has been breached is made by the Prime Minister. And that just isn't good enough. And, and that's why we don't, we rarely see anyone criticised um, for breaching ministerial standards. On the other hand, in the New South Wales ICAC legislation, uh, corrupt conduct includes any serious breach uh, of uh, a ministerial or parliamentary code of conduct. And that's another thing we must ensure we get at federal level because otherwise ministers' decisions go unchallenged and uninvestigated. And ministers, as they have done over these various scandals I've mentioned, continually say, well, it, it's a matter for, of discretion for me. I've exercised my discretion and you can't do anything about it. And, and in saying that, they ignore the fact that they're bound by a statement of ministerial standards, which makes it clear that they must make their decisions in the public interest. And an effective anti-corruption body would be entitled to challenge that uh, claim and investigate it. So I do think that, you know, the serious misuse of public money is, uh, if, it's, if it occurs, is a corrupt conduct by, uh, any standards. 
and it, and it could be serious depending on the amount of money involved. We're talking about billions of dollars of public money being spent to try and win marginal seats. That is a very serious matter that needs to be investigated. When I turn to, uh, as I say, I don't wish to be anything other than bipartisan about this. You can criticise both sides of politics, but uh, I know that uh, Paul Fletcher, for example, uh, when, when asked why uh, the New South Wales ICAC model was, was not to be followed, he said that, um, he, said that um, he described it as a lawyer's picnic. You know, that sort of cheap shot doesn't really um, face up to what this is all about, the need for integrity and the need for an effective system that checks on integrity. And not only uh, Paul Fletcher, but Jason Falinski, another minister recently said, defending their model, it has all the powers of a royal commission. Well, it doesn't. Uh, can you think of any royal commission that we've held, which has been held in secret, where no one knows what's said at the commission? Can you think of any royal commission that doesn't publish a, uh, make a public report? You can't, because that's essential to these bodies being effective. And the second point I wanted to make, finally, is the reason given to me uh, in two or three meetings I had with Christian Porter, where he was clearly not entranced by our push to have such a body, was he said, we are concerned that reputations will be unfairly damaged if your model uh, were accepted. Now, I agree with him. We don't want reputations unfairly damaged. But Helen Haynes's model, for example, and other models around the country do have protections. Uh, they have the rules for public hearings. They have guidelines for fairness. They have uh, a public interest test to be applied if a public hearing is to be held. They have um, uh, an inspector who oversees the uh, integrity of the system. And they have bipartisan parliamentary committees permitted and judicial review before the courts. So there's plenty of protection there. And it's just not good enough to say, we won't have an effective uh, anti-corruption body um, at all, because we don't want anyone to tarnish our reputations. If you've got nothing to fear, you'll have nothing to fear from a federal integrity body. Thanks very much, Ed. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, team, one thing I was remiss and missed at the start was um, that if you do have questions, um, please pop them in the chat. Uh, for those of you less familiar with the functionality of Zoom, if you um, hover your uh, cursor down the bottom of your Zoom window or at the top, depending on how you have your Zoom window um, set up, uh, you'll get a, a range of little options. One of them is a speech bubble. If you click on that speech bubble, that brings up the chat. Um, and there, Anthony, I'll give you some time to mull on this because you'll get to, to, to come back to it um, when we go through the Q&A later. But there is a question in there already, which is, are we going backwards when it comes to integrity or has it always been this bad? Um, so we will hold those questions to the end. But given that's come through, Anthony, I'll, I'll give you some time to mull on that one. Don't um, give me too much time, Ed. Don't give me... <laughs> okay. Um, Saffron, I might hand to you now. So uh, Anthony's obviously spoken uh, a lot about the, the need for a federal ICAC and, and the features that ICAC, uh, features that commission would require. Um, what else is required to restore integrity uh, to politics? And I'll hand over to you. And um, I think you want to share screen as well, yeah? Yes, I will share in a moment. Um, and I also just need to say, I have a little uh, puppy outside who um, is doing quite a lot of woofing if the sound is coming through just let me know in the chat and i'll pop my headset on but i've done so many hours of zoom today that i would rather keep it off so i'll i'll go forward hoping that it works and if not just let me know um so thank you thank you everyone for having me i'm calling in from nanawal country here and would like to also pay my respect to nanawal elders past and present um, I, I would like to circle back to where Anthony started as well, which was um, with the why, um, because uh, obviously this, these, this bundle of issues around integrity is something that a lot of us are starting to feel deeply concerned about, and there's a really important reason for that. Um, so in a healthy democracy, the people that we send to parliament really do represent us and our communities and we know that our leaders will make decisions which put people and planet first. 
Um, so I think most of us would agree that our political system doesn't always work like that um, at the moment. And one really important reason why uh, is what we call corporate capture. So corporate capture is what happens when very powerful private interests can exert so much influence over our political system that they can get outcomes which put their profits ahead of our needs. And the fossil fuels industry and their capture of climate policy is a perfect example of corporate capture in action. It's why we're facing a series of devastating fires, floods, and droughts, all driven by climate change, while our government still wants to spend public money uh, supporting the fossil fuels industry to expand further. So we have to get big money out of our political system so that it works the way it's supposed to for all of us and not just the powerful few. And we have developed a package of reforms that we think would take us a long way towards a better politics. And um, I have quite a lot to run through, so I have made some slides for you. I'd love some feedback uh, whether they're actually useful or not in the chat, but um, let me see how we go. So this is corporate capture, when powerful corporate interests can exert so much influence over our political system that they get outcomes which put their profits ahead of our needs. That is our problem. Um, and then uh, our framework is founded around three pillars. So stamp hat corruption, end cash for access, and level the playing field in election debates. And I am going to walk you through each of those pillars in just a little bit more detail. So the first pillar, stamp out corruption. We need to introduce a strong Federal Integrity Commission. I don't need to talk about that because Anthony just explained it uh, in a lot of detail. Um, but to go with that, we know that we also need a code of conduct for our politicians. We need to set high expectations for our elected leaders and consequences when those aren't met. Um, that's a really important uh, companion to the federal ICAC. Um, we need to strengthen the institutions that keep our government in check. Um, so, for example, the National Audit Office. These institutions uh, need to be adequately funded and free from interference. That's really critical. And finally, when the government appoints people to important roles, that should be done on merit. The second pillar, um, cash for access, refers to the ways in which powerful private interests can buy time and influence with our elected leaders which normal people just can't get um, and to stop this we need to know who our senior politicians meet with by making them open their diaries to the public um, the second part here is that ministers shouldn't be able to leave office and get a fancy job in the industry they were just regulating because that's such a clear conflict of interest and impacts the way that they regulate while they're in a public job and then uh, third, we need to ban big donations to political parties because this creates undue influence um, over our political leaders. And we need to know who is giving money to political parties in real time, not a year later, which is what we have now. Um, so that's the second pillar. The third one uh, is to level the playing field in election debates. Um, for powerful corporations who want to influence public policy, Big donations to political parties are like the carrot and multi-million dollar attack campaigns that they run during election time are the stick. So incredibly powerful combination of levers that they have access to. Um, we have to stop these highly effective election campaigns by corporations who are basically lobbying against regulation by limiting how much can be spent on elections. Um, the second point here is to cap spending on political ads. This is important because advertising costs millions of dollars. It drives a constant arms race in political fundraising and it makes our elections fundamentally unequal. Um, so we need to do something about this. Also, um, in my opinion, those ads just suck and I think we'd all be happy if there were fewer of them. Um, so there's nothing lost there. Um, finally, we need to require political parties and candidates to tell the truth and face consequences if they don't. Um, so that's our framework for a fair democracy. Um, there's a heap more detail that sits under that. I just really skimmed across the surface. We've been spending the last 
18 to 24 months um, consulting with experts like Anthony, community groups, all kinds of stakeholders to make sure that we've come up with the strongest possible framework um, that keeps our politics open to participation from all kinds of people, but means that um, we all have a say and a much more equal say. Um, so I just wanted to wrap up by sharing that we just um, released uh, a national survey of what Australians think about our integrity reforms. We surveyed over 10,000 people from every electorate around the country, including in Bradfield. Um, and I wanted to share those results because uh, they're, they're, um, they're remarkable, I think. Um, so here we go, 73.8 people um, feel like the government doesn't always put people and planet first. They don't really feel like um, our interests are, or the public interest, as Anthony put it, are the driving force behind government decisions. That feels like a huge red flag right there at the top. 94.6 um, feel that corporate and industry interests influence government too often. Um, these ones are around uh, spending limits. So again, super high percentages of people that agree with these positions. Support for political donation caps is 96%. Support for better disclosure is 98%. People would really love to know who's giving money to political parties. Um, election spending is supported by 95% of people who think there should be caps. Um, truth in advertising has been a really big one. 98% of people support truth in political advertising laws. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing there. All of that um, detail is on our website. There's a full report with all the survey results and um, there's electorate data available for some places where we got higher numbers. I think it's just worth sharing because if you have this nagging feeling that, um, you know, our, our system isn't actually working for us and the people that we elect to parliament don't always really represent us, uh, you're far from alone. Uh, we can say a very, very solid majority of the rest of the country agrees with us. The good news being that um, we know exactly what we need to do. We've got all of these reforms outlined in a very simple framework. And the final ingredient that we need is political will. And I'm going to hand back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Saffron. Very clear. Um, I will now pass on to Nick to talk through some of her priorities uh, in the space of improving integrity in politics. Over to you, Nick. Thanks, Ed. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to have a small correction um, on your introduction, Ed. Thank <gasps> you. No, no, I think I might have given you a wrong steer. I haven't been a certified sustainable accountability practitioner, but I have worked alongside others that um, have been, and they taught me a lot about financial audit, non-financial audit which has given me a very important skill set that I've used both to understand and really to interrogate assumptions that underpin environmental, social and governance claims that businesses and governments make. So just a um, not a CSAP person, but very impressive people that taught me a lot. And secondly, um, I want to cover off that um, this matter on, on the next slide, thanks, Ed, which I frequently get asked about is um, once elected, how are you going to form your policies? Uh, I do have a policy background and I know that it requires a lot of deep research, analysis, discussion, review, redrafting and so forth. And so tonight you're not going to get my policies. What you're going to get are thoughts and positions on restoring integrity to our democracy, um, if at all enhancing what we've already heard from Anthony and Saffron tonight. So when elected, this, this schematic will sh shows briefly how I plan to do that. So um, thank you. Well, it should go without saying that every member of the Australian Federal Parliament should be in support of a federal ICAC for all the reasons that Anthony's explained. Um, and similarly, my current lived experience um, has reinforced to me just how important it is that we address uh, and reform our political donation system specifically for election campaigns, um, but also for those periods between um, elections as well. And Saffron has spoken so eloquently to this. I think that there is more to be done and perhaps because I do come from a governance and an accountability background, I think of the needed reform as a governance issue um, or equally um, and as accurately as a, as a cultural issue. And this slide that you're looking at now um, shows you some of the additional measures that I'm keen to prosecute 
Um, and I'll talk about those in the next five to six minutes. Um, but really at the highest level, I'm really keen to deliver a few more checks and balances to help restore integrity around data, debate and decision-making in our parliament and our public institutions as part of Australia's vibrant democracy. And it may surprise some of you who have spent time getting to know me over the last um, few months that I, I know you probably think that I think that the biggest risk to Australia by this government is uh, its lack of climate action. I actually think the biggest risk to Australia by this government is our loss of confidence in our public institutions that help underpin a healthy democracy. Um, and on the next slide, um, what this is, is uh, shows you that the Australian National University's results from their Australian election study, which they do after every federal election, um, a response to a question, which of the following statements do you most, um, do you agree with most? The purple line on the top, people in government look after themselves, or the blue line down the bottom, people in government can be trusted. As you can see from the results, that's been deteriorating to, since 2007, so probably can't, that's, a, that's both parties there. And now at least in 2019, there's just one in four people think that government, people in government can be trusted. I think that validates the findings that Saffron's empirical research has shown from around Australia and in Bradfield as well. So why does this matter so much? Um, most immediately, it means that we find it impossible to deal with the challenges that are existential or have a medium or a long-term lens on it, like climate change, COVID response, reconciliation, because the government decision makers are incapable of looking beyond shoring up support in the short term, repaying the donor or buying off their electorate to ensure that they stay in power. Secondly, um, it's so important because trusting government is important for our economy. Uh, just recently come out of the finance sector. Trust is a, a one of the six capitals that we have in our economy. It's called social capital. And without strong social capital, it's really difficult for business and enterprises to play their part. So if ASIC doesn't give hefty fines that are sufficiently large enough to de deter unhelpful behaviours around, for example, insider trading, then investors and consumers and other stakeholders will just lose confidence in the market and ultimately in their decision to take part in it. So that reduces participation in the market, increases risk and adds costs and la la, it's negative for the economy. So it's really important for business that we have trust in public institutions as well, including our federal parliament. But back to the people and possibly more insidiously is this declining trust becomes self-perpetuating. So when we can all see that a government's making decisions that's not in our long-term interest or in um, our children's interest, but in the interest of, the, of self and loyalists, our trust crumbles a little bit more. And eventually we just stop expecting the government to be anything more than an institution mired in its own self-interest. And we put up with poor decision-making um, and that, is a really terrible thing to do. Um, I would like to try and help change that. So my position is that we need a concerted effort to protect and strengthen many of the institutions that are critical for our democracy. And I've, uh, I have a list of those institutions, it's not exhaustive, but I will no doubt learn more about them when I get to Canberra. So yes, thank you to slide nine. We need to redesign, um, before I go onto this slide, I just wanna um, talk about, no, this is fine. Thank you, Ed, that slide's fine. I'm just, we're not gonna talk about the slide, but I will talk on this slide. Um, that ministers um, are really, we have to redesign how parliaments run just a little bit. Yeah, ministers are no longer responsible to parliament to which they're supposed to be accountable. They are instead to their party leaders, to their whips and to their donors. And even though um, ministers do get a really good grilling, often in Senate estimates, they are accountable ultimately to the House of Representatives. It's the people's house. So as a first step, um, I'd like to do away with question time in its current form, um, which is that Monday to Thursday when Parliament sits 2 p.m. and instead have a ministerial question time. No Dorothy Dixes, they're banned. Um, and the UK system is one that we can look to for how it may work better. So um, it shouldn't be a free-for-opportunity to attack um, 
and defend ministerial decisions, but a respectful opportunity to raise concerns and learn. So we also need to look at the role of the speaker to ensure that the behaviours of the occupier of that position is truly impartial. We've had some absolutely wonderful speakers in the recent past, and I think that speaks volumes to their integrity, but I'm sure any other tragics out there who follow Parliament will agree we've also had some shocking ones. And it's not enough that we rely just on the, the strength of the character of those incumbents. We need better checks and balances to guide the behaviour of the speaker. So more on that once I'm elected um, and once I explore that with um, those options with the experts. But secondly, and yes, this slide here, we need to have clear published criteria for the appointment of senior executive members to public institutions. And we need to have publicly available explanations by shareholder ministers when they depart from those recommendations. For example, in July last year, there were three vacancies on the ABC board. And as is the approved process, an independent panel recommended four people as a shortlist from which the shareholder minister could select. The minister accepted two of the recommendations and a third was a captain's pick. It wasn't included on the shortlist. That third is a pretty experienced senior business executive in the transport sector and someone who has been appointed to the board of another public institution by the same minister. So shareholders ministers have a duty to make these decisions, but there are two concerning things about this appointment. One, we only know about it because of a successful freedom of information request by a media outlet. And two, we don't know the reasons for ignoring either of the two rejected candidates, um, nor the reasons for accepting the captain's pick. And that's because the criteria are not published and the exceptions do not have to be publicly justified. So I don't believe this is acceptable when it comes to these very important public institutions that help underpin our sacred, vibrant and very precious democracy. The ABC in particular, um, it's, uh, it's, I'm just looking on this list here, it's not here because it has a special, um, has its own special challenges and doesn't fit under this particular part of the act. But here what you're seeing is that there are nine government business enterprises and the act under which they come is the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act of 2013. Two corporate Commonwealth entities and seven Commonwealth companies. These nine entities manage literally billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of our assets. And as I mentioned, the ABC is not one of these because it's unique, but these are the nine. And you can see the frequency of board members aligned to a political party now, it's important to note, I'm, I'm not saying being an ex-politician should bar anyone from being or serving on a board, although Saffron's point about immediate appointment post having a portfolio is an important one to consider. Um, but I do hold my earlier point about the importance of trusting in public institutions. I'm also not saying that because there are no ex-politicians on some of these boards that those appointments on those boards are genuinely non-political either. Um, and for example, the chairman of Australia Post, the top there, is also the chairman of the Australian Naval Infrastructure Proprietary Limited and the deputy chair of the Moore Bank Intermodal Company Limited. That's a lot of activity on a small number of very big boards. Furthermore, a board member of the Western Sydney Airport was the captain's pick for the board of the ABC. Now, neither of these um, people are ex-politicians and both are highly competent and experienced executives, but that's some um, really important boards to be on. And why am I concerned about this? If you go to the Department of Finance, um, they have this thing called a flip chart, which um, Rob Mills, who helps me on strategy, showed me. It's just so juicy. It shows all the entities to which the federal government can make appointments. Um, maybe, Ed, we want to go through the next slide. There are 89 body corporates um, and listed of la as of last month um, with board or supervisory positions to be filled. So on top of that, there are 98, so this is where we get the 187, um, the 98 body corp, um, sorry, non-corporate Commonwealth entities to which relevant ministers can make appointments. 
That's a lot of public institutions, 187. One of those, very importantly, is the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which has the responsibility for appeals against, um, to hear appeals against government decisions in the areas such as the NDIS, freedom of, freedom of information, um, national, social security uh, and immigration. And in 2019, just before the last election, one in five people named on the AAT has Liberal or National Party connections. And in this last past week, the Attorney General announced new appointments to this year's round. And that includes six people with Liberal links. Now, last week, the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions, which is a partner of the UN, announced a decision to defer accreditation to the Australian Human Rights Commission as an A-status institution precisely because appointments had been made that were not properly explained or justified on at least three occasions. You can just see where, this, just, just you know, they say the fish rots from the head, yeah? Last Monday, the outgoing member for Bradfield, I'm allowed to say that, appointed Don Harwin, a former Liberal New South Wales Arts Minister to the Australia Council Board. And also last Monday, the Water Minister uh, appointed a former Liberal MP, John McVeigh, as the chair of the Modernising Murray River Systems Technical Panel. The list goes on. There's been many more appointments since, um, since drafting this. Why am I concerned about this? It's because because we've all watched what's happened in the USA, yeah, when Trump was elected and how he just openly and explicitly began to insert loyalists into at least, well, at least like-minded people into executive and judicial roles that would long last after his presidency. And that, that scares me. I know we don't have an American system, but I fear that this is where we are blindly headed if we do not raise the profile of these hundreds of appointments responsible for hundreds of billions of dollars of our funds, setting policy priorities for years to come and providing accountability parameters and decisions that are absolutely crucial for the vibrancy of our democracy. And this is why, it's why I really do believe and it's what the, the main reason I'm standing is to help restore integrity in our federal parliament and to get on and do the cleaning up that we need to do to restore trust in our public institutions. I will be a fierce advocate for doing this once I'm elected. We need leadership and we need those measures outlined by Anthony and by Saffron, as well as the few others I've presented tonight and probably many, many more, just so that we can commence that rebuilding of trust within and between our institutions and our citizenry. Our democracy is precious and it's in danger. And it would be remiss of me not to say vote like your future depends on it. Thank you, Ed. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nick. We have had a number of questions come through. Um, we'll get through as many as we can, but I guess to the panelists, if you can keep your answers uh, short and snappy, uh, that will probably uh, help. Uh, Anthony, I have, uh, I've already forewarned you about one, so I'll expect your answer to that one first. And then I have a couple more to follow up with. So uh, to get us, uh, off and running. Um, are we going backwards when it comes to integrity or has it always been this bad? No, we are going backwards. It's, it's just been too long. The push to have a National Integrity Commission has been seriously um, around since 2015. So for seven years, uh, there's been resistance to this. And the longer it goes on, the more people become entrenched in their positions. And that's why we've seen a lot of sort of government administration shrouded in secrecy, cabinet in confidence, uh, parliamentary privilege, freedom of information being shut down effectively. And, and the longer it goes on, people become accustomed to not being accountable. And so, you know, the situation must be regarded as worse than, it, than it's ever been. And Anthony, there's a couple more questions here that go to, to scope, I guess, of um, an integrity commission. Uh, does the scope of a federal ICAC include maladministration and fraud? Uh, and then secondly, a, a follow-up question, um, why does the scope need to go beyond just public office holders? Well, uh, the, the first point is I, I, I wouldn't include maladministration in the definition of corrupt conduct. Um, I don't think that's what uh, the um, body should be concerned with. Um, but I do think fraud, of course, should be. Uh, it's in any event a criminal offence, so it'll be caught even under the government's model. 
Uh, now, the third part of the question was, just remind me again. Uh, why does the scope need to go beyond just public office holders? Uh, to what? I'm not sure what that means. I mean, it would the whole of the public service uh, is involved, uh, all of the uh, federal police officers, uh, border force officials, taxation officers, Austrac, everybody who works in parliament and, uh, and everybody who's in the public service are caught up with it. So uh, it's not public office holders, it's the whole of the public administration at a federal level. And, and I guess this question is, why would it need to go beyond just those people that we have elected and put in? Why does it need to go to those, um, uh, those people in the public service? Because we have to have integrity in the whole sphere of public administration. It's not much good saying, well, we want uh, six of you to be uh, uh, well behaved, but we don't mind what the other 40,000 do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I'm not quite sure where to, to direct this next one. Um, so, uh, Anthony, please feel free to jump in first, but, but uh, Nick and Saffron, if you've got thoughts. Um, Mal Malcolm raised a question uh, about what about the AFP having a special branch to investigate research and charge and bring um, these people to a housing arrangement, i.e. jail, um, if that was what was required. Uh, look, I'm very much in favour of the work done by the AFP, but they're not experienced in uncovering corruption. And they don't have the special powers that a, an, an anti-corruption body would have. Uh, they can't force people to answer questions that would incriminate them, and nor should they have that power. But a federal, but a federal anti-corruption agency can do that. People need to understand that they have a, a power to compel people to answer questions, even if those answers will incriminate them. And that means they can dig so much deeper. That might sound terrible in a democracy, but it isn't because the trade-off for that power is that that evidence, if given, cannot be used against the person in any civil or criminal proceedings. So it again explains once again why you shouldn't confuse an anti-corruption agency with, say, what the courts do. It's not part of the criminal justice system at all, and most of the evidence it gathers is not admissible in a subsequent criminal um, uh, prosecution. That's a, a, a crucial point, I think, there, Anthony, and maybe worth spending just another 30 seconds on explaining why that is the case, why it's sure. able to go further, but then not admissible. Well, the reason is this, that corruption is hard to uncover. That's why you need a specialist body with specialist powers, like a Royal Commission, to investigate and find out and uncover that corruption. But in doing so, you can expose people to um, where something that the ordinary police force can't do, that is the compulsion to answer questions that incriminate. And so for that reason, um, all of these agencies that have that power um, have a limitation imposed on them. The limitation is if they get that evidence, it cannot be used in subsequent proceedings against the person. And that's a fair trade-off in my opinion. Right, thank you. Saffron, this next one is uh, for you and then, and then Nick, if you've got anything to add, feel free to do so. Um, Saffron, can we just ban political donations altogether? Make all political parties and election campaigns publicly funded? Um, I mean, I, I, I defer to Anthony's view on the constitutionality of an outright ban. We don't actually think it's necessary, though. I think if you cap donations at a modest level, you take away the real problem, which is the ability to buy an undue amount of influence over an elected official. Um, a modest cap will do that, and then you still allow people to participate in the system through making a modest donation if they'd like to do that. We, we prefer that approach. I completely agree that um, public funding is a big part of the solution. Uh, I don't necessarily think it has to be exclusive, but I think you'll find if you cap election spends, um, then you end the arms race where people have to be constantly raising more and more and more money. Um, you cap donations as well, make them transparent, um, fill up whatever the gap is with improved public funding. And also I think it's important to say that the way that we give public funding probably needs another look now, because in terms of uh, the, 
the kinds of settings that make it possible for challengers to participate in our democracy versus those who hold incumbency right now. Um, things like the settings around our public funding can have an enormous impact on that. So I think, um, yeah, there, there is, it's complicated though, right? Like the, the devil is definitely in the details. So um, I, I'm, I'm not so keen on an outright ban. I don't think it's necessary. I'm definitely keen at having another look at public funding and, and how we make that work so that elections really are run for all of us so we can make the best decision. Right. And Thanks. from a legal point of view, I think that a, a ban, a complete ban on political donations would not survive a challenge in the High Court. Uh, the High Court has found that there is a, an implied right of political communication that's a fundamental aspect of democratic life. And so you can't just hold us bold to stop people from participating in the electoral system or the political system. And I agree that for the very reasons that Saffron said, um, there are ways in which we can limit these things, still give people a right to participate, which is terrifically important, whether you're just handing out posters or whether you're cooking sausages at a barbecue or whether you're donating or whether you're just enthusiastically supporting your local candidate. We, we really should encourage all that, but just get rid of the undue influence of money in politics. Nick, did you have anything that you wanted to add there? Um, just from, a, again, empirically, being this way this many weeks into the campaign, I have often thought, because um, 100% of this um, campaign is supported by individuals, even if it's been aggregated through an association incorporated in New South Wales called Voices of Bradfield, for example, they're all individuals. Um, and I think to myself, wow, if we could put these community financial resources into things like uh, Lifeline, like kids for mental health, like it just, so I am, again, a fierce advocate for protecting our democracy. Um, it, there must be a better way of doing it so we get money flowing to the places that need it and not wasted. Um, yes. Uh, Saffron, this is sort of interpreted from several posts. Um, quite a few people have, uh, were, were pleased to see the survey results, etc. cetera. Um, I guess just wondering if uh, you would be able to make the slides available for people if they wanted to share them with um, friends afterwards. I think that we could uh, one up. And, I mean, we have turned those little um, waffle charts into some tiles that uh, are specially for sharing on socials. Um, so if people just want to, uh, I don't know, let you, Ed, know, um, I'd be really happy to send a bunch through. We'd love to have everyone sharing those on socials because uh, you can't make a good decision if you are not well informed. And a big reason that we did this survey was to start a conversation with the rest of the country about, you know, what do we think is important and do we agree on the solutions? And we're delighted to find that there is really high level of support for all of those reforms. Great, excellent. Um, it's a bit of a, a broader question. I might actually start with the question at the end and then, and then provide some of the background. So um, Gregory asked, um, do we need a Bill of Rights? Um, and so Saffron, Anthony, I'll, I'll turn to you first on this one. Um, sure, we get a vote, but the constitution doesn't create positive individual rights and imposes limitations on government which can be ignored with expansive residual powers. So therefore, do we need a Bill of Rights? Any thoughts? <laughs> Well, I think that's such a big debate about whether we need it. Uh, th there are such powerful arguments for and against. Um, you know, uh, as a lawyer, I've got to be a bit careful because every time someone promotes a Bill of Rights, they immediately want to pour buckets of abuse on the judges who would then be controlling in their discretion uh, what rights people have. Uh, so I'll be very careful and very modest in saying uh, I'm neutral on this position. <laughs> right. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Um, that makes me nervous to state a position. Um, we we haven't taken one because our framework is uh, focused on the impact of money, um, which is a slightly um, different question, I think. But I mean, just going back to first principles, I think the reason that the arguments for a Bill of Rights uh, become so compelling is when people don't actually have confidence that the system is um, putting our needs and interests first. Uh, and I wonder whether it would feel as important if we were in a political culture where we really did feel that if we elect someone to parliament, they truly represent us and our communities. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Great. Uh, 
So, but I've received a question through. It's actually come through accidentally as a direct message. So I think people, other people won't be able to see it. It's just come to me. But what about deliberate misinformation, either by foreign actors with malicious intent or local mischief makers like Clive Palmer? Like Clive Palmer? How should we deal with that? Um, well, truth in uh, political communications laws would deal with that. Um, uh, it's a really tricky area because obviously you want people to be able to speak freely and um, determining the truth is a tricky thing. So we're actually still working with a group of stakeholders and experts, um, particularly because now that the digital information space is so complex, um, you really need to think about how you would enforce and implement those laws. Um, so that's uh, something that we're working on now, but I think every time I do an event like this, it comes out um, as a huge concern for the community. People are really aware of the impacts of misinformation um, and just don't want to be lied to. So I think it's definitely an area that uh, whichever, um, whoever forms government in the next parliament, they have a clear mandate to take that forward and figure out what the solutions are. It's really important to do it in a thoroughgoing and consultative way, though, because it's also easy to accidentally get it wrong. And we do have the, the truth in ad, uh, political uh, advertising in two, two, uh, two places in Australia, uh, South Australia, and I think the ACT, isn't it, Saffron? So, I mean, that's good. That, that's a start. But um, we, we um, you know, the Centre for Public Integrity believes that it's really one of those fundamental things we need to get cracking on because there's nothing worse than people being misled by advertising at electoral time. It's so, it's not easy to get it right, as Saffron says, but we've got to stop out and out misrepresentations of fact. We do have, you know, in, in trade and commerce, uh, as Nick would know, we have strong laws to, st to stop misrepresentation and they work very effectively and why we can't do it. Uh, in our political system is beyond me. We, and I hope, you know, that the independents, when they get into parliament, will be pushing the major parties to, uh, you know, to improve the situation dramatically. It was the highest result, I think, in that survey. 98% um, of people agreed that we need to act on that particular problem. So very, very strong support. Covered most of the questions, and I'm really conscious of time. Just, just one final one that came through. It's about, I guess, uh, extent of where an ICAC could potentially go. Uh, so Stuart asked, when scientists provide lobbying services to companies and industries, tobacco mining, etc., on the expectation they will continue to get grants and contracts, this form of corruption has much more de devastating consequences than corruption of a local politician, yet no one extends the definition to this degree. Um, can a federal ICAC possibly be this wide? So can you extend it to scientists working with lobby organisations? Anthony, I might toss to you first. Yeah, well, I don't think any, I don't think the definitions in any of the state or territory bodies go that far, um, but they do extend to third parties uh, in New South Wales. So, uh, and, and that's, there's been a big debate about this, whether third parties can be roped in because of their dealings with the uh, politicians, parliamentarians and so on. So I think that uh, it's something worth debating. Uh, there's not a precedent for it, but there's no reason why the communities can't, uh, you know, uh, consider it and put their uh, put their influence to work, and we might get an improvement on that issue as well. Great, thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. I'll just quickly uh, share screen again and and running through a couple of things that are happening next in the campaign um, before handing over to Nick to uh, wrap us up. So, first things first. Um, Hopefully this message is coming through loud and clear, obviously not from Anthony and Saffron who are nonpartisan, but my message is vote one bull and Nicolette. If you keep voting the same uh, way, things will stay the same. Uh, the second is spread the word. So if you know people who care about integrity in politics and like what Nick had to say about her position, uh, then please share it with them. Um, we'll make that easier for you by sharing some uh, materials such as the recording of, of this session um, that you can share. Um, also take a holiday and help fund the campaign. So um, there are some uh, properties that have been put uh, up, holiday homes have been put up for auction um, that you can go and be on. I will share the, uh, the details of those um, uh, uh, after this session. Um, and finally, keep your eyes on the events page because there will be plenty more opportunities to see and hear from Nick and the team. Uh, without further
further ado, I will hand over to Nick to uh, see us out. Thanks, Ed, and very, very big thank you to um, Anthony and Saffron for sharing your wisdom and experience. Um, and just to let everybody know, the groundwork's been done. Um, so once elected, there's some shovel-ready things to go there, like Helen Haynes' um, uh, Australian Federal Integrity, Federal Australian, oh, it's just terrible, isn't it? Australian Integrity <laughs> Commission, that's it. <laughs> too many, too many answers. But the, the, what I wanted to end with, Ed, is just to say that, um, just to reiterate that the reason I'm, I'm standing is uh, climate change is dire, but this is absolutely, our federal parliament is a critical part of this whole ecosystem in terms of public trust. It is absolutely essential we get on and fix it. I don't think the major parties can get it done. And that's why in this 2022 election, we have so many independents standing um, to try and break that gridlock. We could go the way of the USA, We've seen what that looks like, or we can implement those things that Anthony and Saffron have talked about tonight, lifting that veil of secrecy on decisions and details. So having MP diaries open to see which lobbyists they're meeting with, delivering better transparency and accountability for the board appointments to those public institutions and having public, uh, make public and improve transparency around the criteria and the processes for those, and just start to restore integrity to the actual parliament by implementing an Australian Integrity Commission with teeth. So we heard that the CIC that's been offered by the Liberal National Party isn't going to get the job done. So a vote for them in this election is a vote for the status quo. And I just don't, I don't think we can afford the status quo. Um, I've got a little slogan we can vote on, the status quo has to go. I'm not sure if that works. But very, this is such a serious issue. I, I vote for an independent with real world experience and accountability in government governance is one of our best ways to give our parliament the go to break that status quo. And I'm offering that to the people of Bradfield in this coming election. So if you can please trust me with your vote on May 21, and together let's start to repair our very precious democracy. Thank you.